and also during the Soviet Union and Gorbachev, you had people like Bill Kristol who were doing Plan B, the committee to, for Plan B. So they were laying in wait for their moment. But I'll tell you, the neocons have been bitten in the back side a little by Trump. It's the neoliberals who really, you know, found a way to justify Iraq. It was liberals at some of the think tanks in Washington who paved the way. And I think we're at a moment where we need an alternative. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal, and today I have a special guest with me, an icon of US journalism and publishing, the prolific Katrina van den Heuvel. For decades, Katrina was the editor-in-chief and a pillar of the progressive magazine, The Nation. As such, she was pivotal in giving alternative voices a place to speak, especially when it came to US involvement in wars. I consider her and her late husband, Stephen F. Cohen, as giants of US public peace work and realism in international relations. Katrina has been writing about US domestic and foreign policy for 40 years, and she is also a member of the American Committee for US-Russia Accord that has for many years been pushing for better relations between Washington and Moscow. Katrina, thank you very much for coming online today. Pascal, thank you very much. Uh, I was really looking forward to this talk because you're one of the U.S. citizens who, uh, right after your studies, or even as I understand, during your uh, your university education, you started writing and and thinking about foreign policy, and you've been engaged not only with Russia but basically with the globe from from the United States. So I was really wondering what motivated you to choose this career in news and publishing and what were the major steps um, that you took? Thank you, Pascal. Well, I've been at The Nation for close to off and on 40 years. I was an intern and I think The Nation has given me a DNA which believes in alternatives, alternatives that are not part of a downsized politics of excluded alternatives. And I believed in journalism a journalism of principle, of independence, of truth that was honest about where one stood. So much of US media is, quote, objective. I don't believe that is possible. I do believe that you have a right to your own opinions, not to your own facts, but I don't believe objectivity. So the nation for me and the nation's main through line founded in 1865 was a belief that you couldn't have a real democracy with endless war. So the idea of war and peace was very central to my work, my belief in journalism. So I was at The Nation, and then I worked for ABC News, of all places. They had a documentary division. And the documentary I worked on was loosely built on my senior thesis, which was about the McCarthy period, which has come up quite a bit in these times, the idea of a neo-McCarthyism afflicting our political dialogue, that you speak out and your name names and your kind of squashed your views, but it was that. And then I have to say, I if you can be hijacked, which I was in 1978, going to visit my father, who was a representative to the UN in Geneva, and then get off the plane and write overnight about that experience, I figured I should be a journalist in different ways. Uh, but above all, what animates me is a belief that you can make change and you can advocate for ideas and uh, oxygenate movements and organizations through your writing and through your pen. One thing that I stand uh, behind and I'm very proud I did was I worked for three months during the Glasnost years. This was in 1989 at a Russian newspaper. It was one of the Glasnost newspapers called Moscow News, Moskovsky Novosti. And I covered the parliament, the opening of the parliament. I covered the first quasi-democratic elections under Gorbachev in 1989. And it was important for me to see the editor of that paper, Yegor Yakovlev, cross the street every week to haggle and negotiate with censors. And each week, there was more room. It was a weekly. There was more room, there was more space for whether it was exposés of corruption or abuse or of historical abuse. So those were important moments for me. But to be, have been at the nation from 2000, well, from 1994 to the present is a measure uh, 
it's an antithetical to the opening line of the nation, Pascal. The first line of the first issue, July 6, 1865, the week has been singularly barren of exciting events. Hmm. I've never experienced such a week. And in these times, I don't know how you keep up, but there is a press of news which demands more than just noise, which I fear too much of our media has descended into instead of incisive analysis and signal, especially around issues of war and peace. You know, the it, it seems to me that the news for many years, I can't pinpoint when it started, but for many years, war has been on the news constantly. And that can be the war against Russia. It can be the war against COVID, the war against terror, uh, the war against drugs. Everything's a war. And we are constantly somehow bombarded by the idea that war engulfs us. Do you, do you did you also get that from from your work? I'll tell you, Pascal. I agree with you. There's also the war on poverty. There's war on this. What really worries me at this moment is the demonization of dialogue and diplomacy in favor of moral posturing and rush to military purpose. The militarization of so much, I think, is uh, dangerous. And I think and I'm worried about a generation growing up in that space because we've had alternatives over time. I mean, and what it encourages me, however, I have to say, are, are the protests that are filling the streets of this country around Gaza. And even the grassroots movement, which is truly grassroots around the uncommitted. And that has, you know, a hundred cities, towns are already signed on, but the militarization and the number of wars that the United States is engaged in, I think is very dangerous for the possibility of renewing uh, reform in this country. What I don't know, Joe Biden, President Biden has been domestically a decent president. He passed legislation against all odds. It was tough because of the House and the Senate, but legislation cutting in half child poverty. He's broken the back, not fully, of neoliberal, the neoliberal consensus, which was so much a part of previous Democratic presidents' tenure. But how you have a domestic transformative policy, policies, and have endless war or failure to transform the foreign policy national security, which is old thinking. I don't know how you do that in any sane, clear way. Um, you, what we have seen also over the past couple of years is this, this kind of perverse inversion of what it means to be at peace. The, those who those forces who push for war they always they always do so in the name of peace right and that's that's the trick because everybody wants peace right but they but then the, the trick is to say I only want my peace my peace only the way that I imagine peace and if I can't have that I go to war <laughs> and then we will we will have to go to war do you do you also like contest like see that in in how media is reporting on war that they always use peace language in order to sell war you know that's an interesting point I feel that too few people use the word peace. It's become a kind of subversive term. Mm. And you look weak if you use the word peace too often. Um, you know, our media is, you asked a good question the other day, Pascal, about how how is it that we have this media, which is so full of those who agree, agree with us. There's a kind of suffocating consensus. Mm -hmm. Someone once said, if all think alike, no one is really thinking. And the failure, particularly during times of war, I think particularly of Iraq, because there is a generational component to war, Pascal. Think about those who, whose defining experience was Vietnam, and I'm talking about the United States, Vietnam, Iraq, and then there are those like Samantha Power or Anne-Marie Slaughter, whose experience was Rwanda and Bosnia. And that's a different experience, but the fact that people are on TV during times of war, and most of them are generals or retired generals who have relationships with military industrial companies, which are not disclosed. To me, that is a failure 
of media. And I think back to 2003, I was thinking about it today because MSNBC, one of the progressive liberal cable channels, who's just hired the former head of the Republican National Committee, which has caused a furor here, uh, failed to disclose many generals, retired generals who came on on the eve of war in Iraq and essentially pushed out Phil Donahue, a famous talk show host who was anti-war and openly so on MSNBC, and he was just pushed out. So the tolerance by these corporate powers, because that's, years ago we did a centerfold at The Nation, 1996, and there was Octopi, Octopus, five of them. These were major media companies, GE, News Corp, and news was a little cog in the corporate structure. So the ability to have honest news or alternative dissenting news is really almost increasingly impossible. But this is where it's so interesting because, uh, and it's so interesting talking to you because you also were in the, in the Soviet Union before it collapsed, right? Uh, you were in Moscow and you've seen censorship there, which is the classic version of censorship and repression, how we imagine it. You know, some some gray people in an office that then just strike through things and they, they imprison people that they don't like. But currently we are witnessing this other form of censorship, which is a going along because everybody goes along kind goes of along. version. And it... Why? So I talked. I talked to a Swiss uh, German news anchor who worked for for thirty years in 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 Swiss and German news, and he said, "Look, we would just not publish anything that was critical of the message <laughs> that that we knew was important." And this yeah. is, is the journalism that that came along. And the the Vietnam War was probably really important because the Vietnam in the Vietnam War there was still were pictures and images of Americans getting killed and you know very dramatic pictures and we remember that kind of the picture of the last uh, people That's from the right. embassy being lifted lifted away right and these pictures they vanished and we have embedded journalists and so on so there's a very important media component and I wonder how much of it is uh, uh, like uh, indoctrinated from above from the political level and how, how, how much is a societal a sociological component it's a very good very good question, Pascal. I think, first of all, we did see images during the Vietnam War, but there were essentially three networks and Walter Cronkite was the voice of trust. We have seen images, not enough from Fallujah where US troops were during a, the, the Iraq war. Uh, we did see a lot of the Ukraine war for about two or three months. There was, there were, there was CNN, International, many, but, my view is we should see war. I think we should see, well, first of all, we should, this is not radical. This was something that was in fact discussed decades ago to abolish war, the kellogg briand Treaty in 1920, but the nation opposed it because it was not strong enough. This is an, um, if we could have such today, but um, there, the, there is a willingness to, support war, but not show it. And I'm not sure to, in showing it, if people would understand as generals, retired generals often do, they don't like war because they've seen what it does to their men or women. But I think the problem in this country is people are fearful of sticking their necks out. There's self-censorship, Pascal. To be in an administration, for example, or to a think tank, in Washington, where there isn't much thinking going on, by the way. There are often shadow cabinets waiting to go into the next administration. People don't like to speak up that much. Now, there are more and more uh, because there are different forms of news, which I'm sure you follow. There are different forms of getting news. Uh, you have social media, which is not the, it can be the mistake or it can break through the censorship in different ways. But in general, there is not much welcoming of dissident, independent-minded journalists. Think of how few have supported Julian Assange. It took a while for the newspapers to write the editorials, which they finally did. We, we talked today when I think the extradition danger is lifted for a few weeks as Assange sits in the UK.
But the criminalization, the danger of criminalizing journalism as a first step in going to war has been seen in this country, and it could be again. Moscow is, Russia is very different. In my experience, I have to say, Pascal, was very powerful because my late husband and I went there in 81, 82, the Brezhnev years, and then we couldn't get visas independently or together. We were not married yet, but we got a visa in early March, just a few days after Gorbachev came to power. And Gorbachev's glasnost was essentially an you know, attempt to ease the censorship. It was strongly about de-Stalinization and exposing abuses of historical nature. But I was able to work at this glasnost newspaper. And a few years later in 1993, my husband and I met in the basement cafeteria of Moscow News, Dmitry Muratov, who went on to found um, Novaya Gazeta, the independent newspaper, which is still finding its way in Moscow with a lot of problems, but it's the paper where Anna Politkovskaya and a few and quite a few Russian journalists worked who were killed in covering Chechnya and corruption. So I think today it's more complicated, obviously. And I think what happens with war, as you well know, is that it's not good for independence. It's not good for people who care about independent thinking. It empowers the war parties on both sides. It empowers nationalism. It, repre it empowers repression and suppression of dissident, quasi-dissident voices. You know what I what I see or or tend to think is that whenever we have great powers that manage to be great powers, there needs to, to have been and be in place some mechanisms of social control in one way or another, because you need the population, at least a good part, to go along with policies that might not be peaceful, <laughs> because otherwise you might not be where you are with a large, large population and large military and so on. Um, then the question is, what are the mechanisms that that form this? And one of the ways that we see um, in 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 the in the west is that there has been some form of well integration of several several components right of the political level with yes. with think tanks with journalism with uh money with um the the you know all of these these big money donors like black money donors i mean they're their investment hedge funds that can be very they can cannibalize their own economy but also cannibalize others and then have this in have these entangled interests um the way that things are working now uh in journalism was it the same when you started or did it's it change? A, I, very very good question and it's not just about the technology mm -hmm. there's an ideology as well yeah. i find this among a, a there's a generation which has grown up on social media to an extent where there's a presentism. You're present, but you don't bring to bear history or perspective that might offer more to think about. It's uh, so that that's of concern. There um, isn't an appreciation of the depth of reporting, the trench reporting. It's a lot of social, it's internet and social media, and it's all very quick. There's a privileging of clicks as opposed to knowledge and, and, and history and perspective. There's also a quickness to be tribal. Mm. Tribal in the sense of the demonization of views that you don't agree with, but you literally you know, won't listen. There's very little listening which I think, you know, a Glenn Greenwald, I admire Glenn Greenwald. I think one concern is he punches down sometimes when he, but he's, you know, he's someone who has understood how elite the projects are that the media covers. There's unwillingness or un disinterest in covering where people are at. There's also, I mean, the difference when I was getting into the journalistic field you had robust regional papers. You now have these news deserts and you have a lot of interest in nonprofit news, which is okay, but it's not gonna be the silver bullet, excuse the word. And it also leads to more conformity because the foundations 
are supporting publications and that there's a kind of trifecta of media, political, not neutrality, but political objectivity and foundation support. Um, I think the nation is revealing about the changes. When I was uh, first started, we had Christopher Hitchens as a columnist, mm. Alexander Coburn, um, and there was no social media, but they were, how to put it, they were not easily categorized. Now Hitchens had his own of you know adventures, but there's a little more of a conformity in the progressive independent media community, which I think has been to some extent incited in the last eight years by Trump. There's a shock that Trump has arisen. What there isn't is a global sense that there, first of all, there are many elections this year, not just the US election. And the conditions that create a Trump are not, you know, are, are not so much the man, but the, the coverage of personality instead of ideology or ideas doesn't give an adequate force to the changes, the extraordinary changes and disruptions. I like to say that not to, well, I like to quote, Gramsci, the Italian communist, who said that, you've, I'm sure you know it, that the old order is disappearing or dying and the new one, new world hasn't yet been formed. And in that kind of cusp, the pathologies of time emerge. And it 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 feel it feels like that. It feels like something is really breaking apart internationally, but looking at the United States also inside the US. And this is this is scary because it it has huge danger. Instability has huge dangers, uh, brings huge dangers with it. And also, you know, for as much as we like to think about the distribution of power being something wonderful, distribution of power over many different branches can go horribly astray. It's the reason why this country, Japan, went to war with the United States, which was That's suicidal. Right. It was suicidal. And they did it because power was not concentrated, but, you know, the, the military was able to basically drag the rest the rest along. into, And they, even they were not unified behind what they wanted to do. Um, now, you've seen a great empire fall apart, right? And we went from, we went from uh, 1989, uh, George Bush Sr. telling the, the Rada in Kiev, please do not, do not secede because we are afraid of instability. We don't want the Soviet Union to fall apart. That would be very dangerous because nuclear weapons and everything, and who knows what's, what's going to come next. Two, we went to 30 years later, uh, Ukraine had to become a NATO member. There's no other way. You know, this is, this is the most important thing in the world for the free world. And otherwise we're going to all die if it doesn't happen. <laughs> it is a crazy transition. No, it's remember. crazy. I was thinking, I was thinking also uh, the other day, you know, the terrorist attack in Moscow, I don't believe President Biden has called Putin to offer condolences or empathy. Um, maybe that's impossible, but George W. Bush, um, Putin went to the U.S. Embassy after 9-11, the day after to sign the condolence book. He was the first global leader to call Bush to offer his assistance. Mm -hmm. So you think the attempt to have some kind of trust, maybe trust but verify, has so broken apart that there's no, there's not even a call, and there's such anger and uh, displacement in a sense. But it's very clear what happened after 1989 to me, and in conversations with John Mearsheimer and Ambassador Matlock, there was a you know a promise given to Gorbachev, reunified Germany, NATO would not move one inch eastward. NATO is treated by many as a kind of coffee clutch. I mean, it is a military institution. It is about weapons. It is about the interoperability, which leads the US to demand that other countries buy their weapons, though we seem to be running out of weapons. But it's, it's a boondoggle for the military industrial complex. The idea that it is the instrument, the security architecture of Europe, when it could have been what Gorbachev spoke about, common European home stretching from Vladivostok to 
Lisbon, right? Or the OSCE, or even the EU. These are not beloved institutions, but they're not fundamentally military. So the militarization of relations, and you know, Pascal, I mean, there was debate about expansion of NATO. I mean, we did a special issue, leading senators, Bill Bradley, Gary Hart, George Kennan, the esteemed diplomat, Ambassador Matlock testified before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee that this might be the greatest strategic blunder, you know, at the end of the Cold War. And it was, and I think we've seen it. Um, it threatens. Now, you have a whole situation now where new countries have been become members. Sweden, fin, you know, Finland. And I think what the tone in my mind is half of life. The fact that there was such triumphalism at the end of the Soviet Union, that was a negotiated settlement. And it became a triumphalist celebration of America as the power, the unit power. And in that, people will say, certainly to John Mearsheimer, you know, you can't just bet it on NATO, but every sector of, of Russian society, not just the Gorbachevs, the Westernizers, but Yeltsin was fiercely opposed to NATO and others. So I think it's something of a strategic, great strategic blunder to be here looking at this brutal, cruel war. What has happened, and I mentioned Trump before, he has said things like, Europe should bear more of the burden. And people went crazy. And if you said something like that, the sadness are scrambled politics, you're Trumpian. But I went back and looked at 97 and later, and Secretary of Defense in the Clinton years, Bill Cohen said, it's no free lunch. I mean, everyone was lecturing. And the danger today and has been for the last years, few years, is that Trump has kind of degraded some of the ideas that are central to an alternative world. That is true. And now I remember what I wanted to ask you, because Trump is one thing, but the other thing is the influence of the neocons in Washington. And, you know, we have people who are the, the polar opposite in the United States. You named them, right? Jack Matlock and uh, I mean, your, your late husband. So on. They, they, those are all the people who oppose the neocons and the neocon worldview that we, you need to do everything you can in order to split Eurasia into little parts and have them fight with each other. Um, but for some reason, we went from 89, where there was a shared vision. I mean, George Bush Sr. and Gorbachev, they had slightly different ideas of how it should be structured. But at the end of the day, it was like, OK, let's let, let's end this very uh, horrible tragedy. But yes. then the neocons come out and the neocons, you know, Wolfowitz, Brzezinski and so on. They wrote books. They wrote about this. And everybody on the Internet says, oh, well, just read Brzezinski and Wolfowitz. I mean, it's, it's all been laid out. Yeah. But at the end of the day, Wolfowitz and Brzezinski are just two lone nuts like you and I. And but they have outsized and Fukuyama. They have outsized influence. And influence well, this on the goes thinking. on today, Why? Pascal. This goes on today, Pascal. I mean, I will say, go back to Reagan, whose less, whose whose history with Russia, Soviet Union is not understood. I mean, President Biden at the State of the Union a few weeks ago spoke of the Reagan who said, "Tear down this wall, Mr. Gorbachev." Well, he didn't end that way, and what he did was take on the neocons in his own administration. He had George Shultz and James Baker, who are not neocons. He fought Cap Weinberger, his Secretary of Defense. There is no question that the rise of the neocons, which was consistent with the end of the Soviet Union, and also during the Soviet Union and Gorbachev, you had people like Bill Kristol who were doing Plan B, the committee to, for Plan B. So they were laying in wait for their moment. But I'll tell you, the neocons have been bitten in the backside a little by Trump. It's the neoliberals who really you know, found a way to justify Iraq. It was liberals at some of the think tanks in Washington who paved the way. And I think we're at a moment where we need an alternative. And the Quincy Institute in Washington, founded five years ago by Trita Parsi and Andrew Bacevich, Andrew being a most cogent criti critic of the empire and the feeling that we are the sole superpower, has been a valuable, inter it's an, a valuable intervention it is still seeking its way, uh, but it is an alternative that people can turn to 
for voices, for scholarship. And I think that's important because you can't be something with nothing. And there's some very interesting people involved. So I take heart from that, uh, as I take heart from the fact that I think so much of our foreign policy is an elite project and doesn't really consist of listening to people or, um, I don't think people want to go to war. I think they want security. I don't believe, I don't like to be called an isolationist, nor does anyone at Quincy. It's an alternative engagement with the world. Less, you know, it's restraint and dialogue, not military engagement. So it's uh, it's tough because the military is a very fierce presence and has been in this country for so long. Yeah, and it does it does go along with some of the in industrial capacity of the United States and some well, of the money. What's interest. happened is uh, we're living now. We've lived with Keynesianism when it's right. It's military Keynesianism now. It's 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 saying that we're creating jobs by create by building weapons, and in fact, the jobs that the weapons producers create are far less productive than healthcare or education. So. Yeah, I do think of the US as a militarized society because military is in the minds of, of, of a lot of people. And the one thing you cannot do in the US, that's the end of any politician, if you criticize veterans, it's the end. No, and I, I think it is the end. Um, and I do think when I look at Russia today, the and both Russia and Ukraine, and I know we'll talk a little about Ukraine, it's the mobilization right now that I think confronts both countries with terrible political hum human issues. But in Russia, like it was the case, certainly in Vietnam in this country, it's the poor, it's in rural communities. It's it's not those sitting in Moscow at the cafes. And I think the former Prigozhin, the Wagner group, he was risking a populist backlash by criticizing those who were sitting at cafes as opposed to fighting. But they're conscripting, as you know, co co convicts, people from rural communities, and maybe it's military Keynesianism of a more humane kind. They're paying families enormous amounts of money in Russia uh, so that the son or the father will go fight. And the level, the ages are just hor horrific. It's up to 60. You can be conscripted, drafted. Let's I'll tell you move. what I'm worried about, Ukraine, the reconstruction of Ukraine, which will have to be. I mean, you one has to move from this brutal 21st century version of World War I, the trenches, and the cruelty. Um, the reconstruction is going to be maybe $2 trillion, $3 trillion. There's a conference in Berlin in June. There was one in London a few months ago. There was so little money put up, but what is happening is that the Black Rocks and the Black Stones and the big corporations are going in and will probably help rebuild, but at what cost? Because it's kind of a version of shock therapy emerging from a war. Mm -hmm.